What's up, military millionaires? I'm your host, David Perret. And today, I'm still here with Alex. I haven't replaced him yet, despite the fact that he keeps showing up. I don't... He's still here, so I guess we're stuck with him. But today, we're here with Brandon Jenkins. So, Brandon has been in the War Room Mastermind for a long time, which is really not the highlight of what he has done in his life. But for some reason, I decided to drop that first. But he's been in the Navy for 20 years. Yeah, he is. He is. He is an OG. He's one of the originals. Uh, he's been in the Navy for 20 years. He's a, uh, I'm going to say MH60 pilot, but he's a helicopter pilot. Uh, he was a commanding officer for the last three years. He's currently stationed up at the Naval War College. He's, <clears throat> he does uh, insurance stuff, uh, insurance sales. He also, I guess sales is the right word. Uh, education. He's licensed in that product realm. I don't know. There's some. There's an official way that you're supposed to say that, and I'm sure I butchered it. Financial uh, professional, but, Dave. Financial professional. There, there we go. All right, there <laughs> we go. So he he has corrected me quite a few times online about things that I have misworded in the insurance realm, and I've actually learned quite a bit from him about it, as well as real estate, as well as uh, he he loves personal development, and he he's just a really cool guy, right? And so we've talked obviously in and around the online platforms and group calls and zoom calls and small groups and big groups and all this other stuff and realized that we just hadn't been on a podcast yet. And so here we are. So Brandon, welcome to the show, brother. Welcome to the Military Millionaire Podcast, where we teach service members, veterans, and their families how to build wealth through personal finance, entrepreneurship, and real estate investing. I'm your host, David Perret, and together with my co-host, Alex Felice, we're here to be your no BS guides along the most important mission you'll ever embark on, your finances. Vehicle 1, you're clear to depart friendly lines. Roger, Vic 1, Oscar Mike. Hey guys, if you're looking to take your investing, business, life, or just yourself to the next level, then I have something for you. The War Room Real Estate Military Mastermind Group is a mastermind group that meets weekly in small groups of five to six people to help you hold yourself accountable and really experience that growth. But we also have a monthly guest speaker that we bring in, and we've had guest speakers that talk about mindfulness, taxes, We're bringing in somebody to talk about marketing. We bring in very specific topics that will adhere to very broad, any any kind of real estate investing or investing or entrepreneurship that you want to do, and we'll really help you out. We let you ask these speakers questions and get very personal with them. And then back to the small groups, weekly accountability for what you're trying to achieve and just being surrounded by like-minded people. And they say your network is your net worth. I know that's an overused phrase, but I recommend that you check it out. So just shoot an email to wrmastermind at gmail.com. Once again, that's wrmastermind at gmail.com. And we'll send you some more information. Thanks, Dave. Uh, It's good to be here. I appreciate you inviting me on. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, you want to give the 30 second over your 30,000 foot view of uh, what makes you tick? What, what brings us to date? Sure. Uh, you kind of hit on a little bit, but 20 years in the Navy. I just finished up my command tour of uh, HSM 46 in NAS Jacksonville, Florida back in March. I'm up here in Newport, Rhode Island right now at the War College, uh, getting my learn on for the next year or so. And then uh, I don't have orders after that yet, so so we'll see what happens after that. Um, you also mentioned the financial professional piece. I I what I'd like to say that I do right is I help leaders, real estate investors, and and entrepreneurs, small business owners. Uh, I help them become more resilient, and I help them build resilient financial strategies. And I use infinite banking to do that, um, which. Uh, has gotten a lot more kind of marketing hype in the last few years or so. Um, but I, I took a, a shine to that, a liking to that uh, quite a few years back. And it, it actually changed my financial trajectory. And I wanted to help other people do that. Why is infinite banking? Well, first off, can you explain what it is? And then second, why is it popular now all of a sudden? Well, first, infinite banking is a cash flow management strategy. It is a capital preservation strategy. It is building an alternate source of financing into your financial strategy. All things that can make you more resilient. 
What it is not is a financial product. Uh, it is it is not magic. And I think that the reason it has taken off recently, um, it just has to do with, in my opinion, social media and the ability to, for anyone really to kind of position themselves as practicing or helping you implement infinite banking, which is a concept. It was developed, not developed, but it was it was made popular and the term was coined by Nelson Nash um, with his book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And that was late 90s, early 2000s, I think. People have since taken the term and just applied it to cash value life insurance and specifically cash value life insurance where you build high cash values early on. You don't really focus on the death benefit. You focus on the cash values. And so there's a difference between infinite banking, actually practicing the strategy and positioning the tool, which is the life insurance, into your strategy to be more resilient. There's a difference between doing that and simply buying a life insurance policy that focuses on high cash value. Um, so does that help with kind of the differences? You there? know, I've been hearing this term and, and this thing around for like, I don't know, four or five years now. And every once in a while, I can get somebody to explain it to me concisely. But for the most part, no, I don't really understand what it is still. I think my big issue with it, and, and Brandon, you and I have talked about this, and I think this is why we get along on it, is insurance is a fairly unregulated uh, industry, right? And so I say that, obviously, it's got regulations and, and everything, but there, there are... My biggest gripe, right, is that every insurance rep I talk to says, oh, well, the reason that doesn't work is because every other insurance rep doesn't know how to structure this, but I do. And then you talk to the next guy and he's like, well, that guy doesn't know how to structure it. I do. And every single rep says that, right? And and they, you know, and they don't even know the difference between a direct recognition and a non-direct recognition policy and, and this, that, and the other and all the other things. Um, <clears throat> and they just... It's it seems to be toted a lot on social media as this like almost get rich quick first level of investment strategy. And you hit the nail on the head right out the gate. Capital preservation, cash flow management. I think if you can overfund it, you need capital preserve. It's it's like uh, the example I use for people is like Susie Orman talks online about index funds, stock market, blah, blah, blah. But she invests in bonds and people gave her a lot of flack. Like, well, you talk about this, but you do this. When you have a $50 million net worth, your investment strategy changes from quick growth to capital preservation. It's a different strategy. So same thing with like insurance. A 20-year-old doesn't necessarily need to be as concerned about preserving capital as they do growth. And a, somebody who's amassed a ton of wealth probably makes a lot more sense to overfund an insurance policy as opposed to be worried about how much, you know, I don't know if I'm explaining that right. But that's that's where I get frustrated about it. And like when I see it in my Facebook group is people are like, cash out your TSP and roll it into whole life insurance. And I'm like, that should not be your first investment. No, no. So. The gist is you're going to um, over, as David said, you're going to overfund this cash value life insurance policy, and then you can borrow against it. Is that sort of what's going on? So let me go back to something I said earlier. All right. First off, it's not for everybody. All right. Second off, you have to understand any financial product you buy. You have to understand how it's going to fit into your overall strategy, right? To me, the infinite banking concept or positioning the whole life insurance in your strategy, you're, what you're doing is you're building an alternate source of financing that is going to be there to make you more resilient when market volatility happens, when you're a small business owner and revenues are, are low long enough to where, oh, how am I going to make payroll? You have an alternate source of financing that you can tap into to weather the storm, to keep fighting through the hits. 
all right, to bounce back when you get knocked down. So for me, that is why it's positioned in my financial strategy. And so when you understand that, it becomes a tool in your strategy and it's not just, it's not magic. It's not just a, a, you know, hot topic item. Okay. It's something that is positioned there and serves a real purpose in your overall financial strategy. So it's not just put the insurance policy in place and then take policy loans out and all of a sudden you're doing infinite banking. You have to have a strategy. You have to have a reason for taking a policy loan. And then you have to have a strategy to pay it back. What you're doing is by capitalizing the policy, your money is in there and untouched. The policy loan is a loan from the insurance company. It's not your money. And that's why there's an interest rate attached to it. It's just like a home equity line of credit. It's not just like, but it's very comparable to a home equity line of credit. You build up equity, you can leverage the equity via the home equity line. By doing that, you leave the underlying asset untouched. Your money is untouched. The whole life insurance policy is untouched. In the case of a home equity line, the house, you still own it. It's untouched, right? Meanwhile, the value is serving as collateral on the loan so that you can use the loan or the cash value to put into other opportunities, other investments, et cetera. How is this different than, say, a CD loan? Say I take $100,000, I buy a CD, and then I can borrow against it from the bank. Is that similar? Is that This is a similar what we're talking about? Uh, I haven't done that. So, But what you're describing, capitalizing an asset, a CD, and then using that as collateral for a loan from the bank, it sounds like very similar, similar process. All right. So the life insurance policy has very unique characteristics as an asset, though. The cash value growing inside of it is growing tax free. First of all, uh, ta- it's when also you, support- tax free. How you pay taxes before you- it's gro- you pay taxes after it's growing tax free. The premiums are after tax. OK, they're not tax deductible. So then you pay your premiums. The cash value is growing while the policy is intact, while the cash value is in there. You don't pay taxes on any of the earnings while it's growing. And then the only time you pay taxes if um, when you withdraw is a if you withdraw beyond basis. In other words, if you withdraw more than what you ever put into the policy. Or if the policy lapsed for some reason and you had an outstanding policy loan or the cash value was more than what you would put into the policy at that point, there would be a taxable event. The death benefits income tax free. Uh, and then the only other uh, avenue where it might be taxed is estate taxes. It does factor into your estate, uh, the value of your estate. So there could be estate tax implications uh, there. Where does the capital um, go to grow? Like what's the, what's the growth mechanism? Like is it in the, is it in a money market? Is it in a fund? No. So the whole life, whole life insurance, like I'm talking about whole life insurance policy from a mutual insurance company that pays dividends. The whole life policy has, there's a general account at the life insurance company. And so all of the whole life policies, the cash value is part of the, the, general account. So it's not a separation of, hey, my cash value is in an investment account and the death benefit component is separate. It's all one. And so, and this is, this is very interesting because this is why an insurance company making a policy loan to you as a policy owner, it's one of the safest places that the insurance company can lend out money. And that's because from their general account, they're going to invest their funds to make a profit. Okay. As a mutual insurance company, the policy owners own the company. So it's in the best interest of every policy owner for that mutual insurance company to be profitable. If folks are taking out loan policy loans, then the insurance company, instead of investing that money from their general account where they normally would have invested it, they are instead lending it out to the policy owner. And so the that is where the interest component comes in. So the insurance company is going to char- charge an interest to the policy owner for borrowing against the policy because they could have invested that somewhere else and earned money for the company and all of the policy owners as a whole. 
Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So I guess pragmatically what I'm asking is, what do I make? Right. What do I make? If I give, if I say, I'm going to give you a hundred thousand dollars with the idea that it's going to sit there, like you said, safely. And if I need to, I can borrow against it. Right. What do I make? What's my, you know, what's my return for giving you the money? Obviously, you know, including that there's a, you're not giving me any money. Who am I giving money to? The insurance company. Well, okay. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> if I, if I, if I give, if I give this, um, if I, if I invest this or buy this, this, uh, insurance product, is there, do, do we know what the rate of return is on that and how it's calculated and then, and then, you know, how it's, what, what would the loan rate be so that I know the Delta? Cause the idea, as far as I was sort of told was the, the infinite banking idea was right. That term comes from, I could put money in and then I could borrow it at a cheaper rate. So I could make money on the Delta while the insurance company had my money. That was the sort of the pitch that was sold to me years ago. That's why it was called infinite because I could give a hundred thousand dollars and then I could borrow, you know, and earn 6% and then I could borrow it at 4%. So I make 2% on my money while I have all my money for free. Sort of like that. That was the pitch. Right. Yeah. That's that, that does sound like a yeah. pitch. Yeah. And that is why I have an issue with <laughs> well, I'm so trying many to get of these to, guys. I'm, yeah. So, I, you know, and, and since yeah. then I'm, I'm still, I, I sort of wrote it off as compli unnecessarily complicated. I mean, I'm being blunt, right? I sort of wrote it off as this is unnecessarily complicated. And I'm, I have a degree in finance. I spent 10 years in banking. I'm not an idiot. Well, I'm sort of an idiot, but I'm like above average idiot. <laughs> right. And so I'm like, if I can't explain, if I can't yeah. understand it, right. It's sort of like in 2008, they had these derivative derivatives on in, in mortgage securities. It was incredibly complicated. Right. And it sank. And I'm not, I'm not equating these two and, but it sank the global economy because nobody understood it and it, it had risk that people didn't understand. And so I'm trying to get a simple, really simple understanding of how this works. So that I know that it's, um, so that I can wrap my brain around it. Yeah, I think you said it. Simplify it. Okay. When you start talking about the deltas from the policy and the policy loan interest rate compared to the internal rate of return on the cash values, people, people who are talking about it like that are kind of missing the point. The point is you have to store your capital somewhere. It could be a CD. Could be a bank account, right? Savings, checking, could be a money market. You could prefer to, to have everything in checking except for what's in the equity of your homes. And you store everything in, in the equity of your real estate. You have to store it somewhere. And so what infinite banking is, you're store, you're choosing to store your capital inside the whole life insurance contract. By doing that, paying your premiums, building the cash value. That pool of capital is guaranteed to continue to grow. And you can leverage that guaranteed by the contract with the insurance company. Therefore, you're storing your capital somewhere, which you have to do. It's growing and it's building equity inside the asset that you can leverage. And so it's an alternative source of financing. It is not the end all be all. And that's what, that's what drives me nuts is when. I hear other agents marketing it like it's this magic system where you're going to recoup all of life's interest costs. And when you pay back the loans, you're paying back yourself. Not true. You are building an alternate source of financing. And that is coming from you can you can assign it to a bank and take a bank loan against it if you wanted to. You can take a policy loan from a life insurance company. Okay. It is a, an asset that is assignable that you own that you can leverage. And because of that, you are more resilient. Okay. When you run into to any aspect of your life where you need to borrow, that is another option. And so you could look at your, your capital, your capital that's built up inside the policy and you could say, all right, I have options. I can try to go to the bank and get underwritten for a loan. Or I've got this pile of capital sitting right here that I can leverage, right? It gives you options. And so you can look at the interest rate from the life insurance company. You can look at the interest rates that you could get from the bank if you were to assign it to a bank and collateralize it. You could look at what you're going to get on your home equity line. All right. And you have options and you can make choices. And that's it. That is how it is positioned. So in my strategy, my money goes there first because 
hey, I've got to store my dollar somewhere. I choose to store it there first so that it's building cash value and it's an ever growing source of finance for me. And then I leverage that into my syndication deals, my single family homes, my duplex, my business. I've leveraged it for in, in do this is not the ideal thing to do with a policy loan, but the point is I can do it. And so I've leveraged it for a car. I've leveraged it to go on vacation, right? Not that is, again, that is not the ideal way to utilize a policy loan. However, it provides resilience. It provides me options. That is how I position my own life. And that's how I describe it. You, you can, under, I'm sorry, David, you can understand, <laughs> you can understand why this is, um, you know, with the term infinite banking, it just draws criticism. No fault. You know, I don't know who, I don't know why that, well, I know why it got popular because it sounds just so good, but, um, um, I do, it does sound much more appealing to have a, an equity account that is more flexible. I mean, obviously I can't do that with a CD. I'm at the mercy of what the bank will sort of let me do with a CD. Yeah. Even with home equity lines, right? You have to get underwritten. And so, you know, people with large real estate portfolios, you got all this equity in your home. Well, if you don't have options for financing, you still have to go to the bank and you still have to go through their underwriting process to get access to it or sell it, right? And so there's a lot of policy loans, no underwriting, contractually guaranteed. Policy, policy loan payback, you determine that whatever works for you. I, I recommend you always have a payback strategy because they are loans like any other loan that will accrue interest. And if you don't watch it, it'll eventually exceed the cash value, right? So you have to have a strategy. However, if you fall on hard times and you can't make a, a loan payment, there's no liens on anything except the cash value. And so you're not, if you use that loan payment for the down payment on your duplex, the life insurance company doesn't have a lien on your duplex. So you miss a payment, they don't care. A life insurance company doesn't care if you miss a payment because your cash value is already there backing it up as collateral. And so if the loan balance exceeds the cash value, they're just going to cancel the policy and pay off the loan. You don't want that to happen, but it explains why the life insurance company is feels so safe and secure in loaning you the money. Yeah. Also, for all of my friends out there, who have HELOCs that are just sitting and wait, waiting for market prices to come down and you know the economy to look ugly, that they're going to whip out all that cash and go buy something. I warn you that that will not be possible because when the bank risk goes up, they're going to put a kibosh on all those HELOCs. They did it in 08. They actually did it in 2020. For a lot of people, they started seeing their HELOC um, maximums reduce and their credit card maximums, their lendable reduce, where it doesn't sound like, you know obviously, if this is equity, then they can't do that. So that's a really good point too. If you got a bunch of cash sitting around and you know it's a little bit different equity versus debt, but that HELOC strategy is not going to work in a down market like anybody, like a lot of people think is going to happen. I'm not going to go and recommend this to anybody because unless you're in a really good financial position and have a lot of discipline, it's not a good move. In fact, I'm going to talk hypothetically, but hypothetically, if you had a line of credit, and you pulled every dollar out of it right now and left it in a checking account and then just used it to just make the minimum payment on said line of credit, then they couldn't close your line of credit. You would have the money already. They're not going to call it due. They're just going to be like, well, shit, he already That's what I did it. in March of 2020. And then you have the cash. Yeah, I've you, got a line David, did you do pulled. this infinite banking thing? Not yet, no. Um, there's a chance that I may at one point utilize it. Um, you know, I, I got, and this is part of why I'm so jaded about it. I got sucked into, uh, first command whole life when I first got into, uh, financial stuff way back in the day. And it was a cash value. It, dude, I invested in that thing for like four years and I had $1,200 in cash value. It was a terrible, th it, you know, and it was, I didn't know what I was doing. He didn't know what he was doing. It is what it is. Right. Um, and, and, and unfortunately being in charge of a massive Facebook group, 
I am the one who weeds out all the spammy comments. And so I see all of the pitches, which is why you've probably seen me in the Facebook group and Brandon's seen it where I'm trying to instigate these guys, like the guys who are actually doing the really spammy pitches, the guys who don't really know what they're talking about. Um, I've been trying to get one. I'm like, you know what? Hey, I will unblock you from the group. If you will do a live video with me and allow me to record it. And I hear your pitch. And they're like, well, let me just do it. I'm like, no, we record the call. No one has ever taken me up on it. The only people who've ever taken me up on it, Brandon's offered, but there's no point because I, I know Brandon's viewpoints. That's not the point. Or Will Duffy, like, okay, but he knows what he's talking about. That's, those aren't the people I'm trying to – I'm wanting to have the actual dialogue with one of the guys who has just been spoon-fed the pitches. Because one of my other favorite pitches – you'll appreciate this one, Alex, if you've never heard it before. My favorite pitch, I believe, out of all of them – is, but what if you had your entire retirement savings in the stock market in 2008 and you retired and then the crash happened and you were retired and you lost everything? Then now insurance would have been the best thing ever. And I'm like, that, and, they're, and they use it as like the, the hypothetical, like perfect storm to say insurance never loses money. Therefore, it's the best investment ever. And I'm like, Okay, but what if we backed the exact same scenario out over the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years? It's like insurance is – because they try to say it's an investment strategy rather than a capital preservation strategy. And they're just – they're different assets, right? And and I have nothing against insurance as an asset class. I just have something against it when somebody tries to tell me that it is a you know get-rich-quick strategy as opposed to a capital preservation strategy, which I agree with you. It's a cash flow management, capital preservation, savings, equity vessel, and is all of those, it makes perfect sense. It just I don't it doesn't outpace an index fund for accessible long term growth. Yeah, I you know I had a I was having a conversation the other day and the bottom line is if you have to make it seem like this incredible magical thing and it can't just stand on its own as hey whole life insurance has been an asset class has been an asset for hundreds of years and there are tons of ways that it can help you in your estate planning in your capital preservation like we've been talking about i i use the term infant banking because that is a term that was coined by somebody else it was a book right i'm an authorized infinite banking practitioner which means I've also gone through some extra training in how to actually implement a strategy as opposed to just trying to sell products. And, but, but if you have to doctor up your language to make it seem like something it's not, then you're probably not, either the person doesn't know what they're talking about, A, uh, or B, it's not as good as what they, they, th they, they say, right? Because they're trying to make it sound better. Um, I want to go back to your, your example of like, what if you had all your money in the stock market during the crash and you were retiring that day or that year? I just want to go back to what I've been talking about the whole time from a resilience standpoint. If you had been building a separate alternative source of financing because you wanted that in your strategy to be more resilient, for down markets, then in the down market, you would have had another option to leverage or to tap into instead of, let's say you did retire and let's say you were on a, you know, a typical withdrawal strategy that you hear, you hear out there 4% rule. And let's say that that year you were supposed to take your 4%. Okay. If you had no other options and you had to live and you couldn't get another job, if you, if the market went down 20, 30% or whatever it went down, right? And then you also had to withdraw, you are compounding your losses at that point. Having an alternate source of financing just makes you more resilient. It's not a magic pill. It's just, hey, I've been capitalizing this over here as a way to, for me to withstand some volatility in the markets. Then that is why it's in my strategy. That is why I position it in a client strategy. That's a perfect yeah, example. It's, good, it's definitely a good supplemental. So uh, I know before we started recording, we, 
we said we weren't going to talk about insurance the whole time. I, Alex, well, if you don't I have, just want to say, you know, I've, you been, I've been question. screwing around with this. Uh, it's on the outskirts for a few years. And I do appreciate you, Brandon, because, um, I, you know, you did explain it in a way that's, um, that finally makes me feel at rest that I know what this is. And it's, and I sort of know where the, um, you know, my, this thing pings my BS meter right, right out of the gate. It's called infinite banking. So I'm like, okay, you're selling me something. But so I do really, I do really appreciate that you, you gave it to us straight and, uh, and it expressed its real benefits and um, real detriments and what it is and what it isn't. So I do, I do appreciate that. But we said we were going to talk about some personal development. So you mentioned a coach that you've worked with and some, and that you in, really enjoy personal development. And I don't actually know what question I should start with in that realm to kind of open that door up. So is there a specific direction you would like to go in that conversation? Like maybe a specific piece of uh, coaching that's been, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I guess really the question could probably be, is there something that you took away from your coach that you like to work with others? Let me go back to the reason that I hired a coach. So uh, it was a couple months prior to taking command and something that I've always been pretty introspective guy. I've always been into personal development. Um, you know, I think that my gateway book was seven habits of highly effective people way back in the day. Uh, I've just always been drawn to that. And about four or five years ago, I, I don't know exactly how long, but I read start with why by Simon Sinek and that book really it, it inspired me. It, it made me just really want to dig deep to figure out myself, to figure out my why, right? As he explains it in his book. And so I toyed around with that. He offers an online course. He has another book called Find Your Why. And so I tried all that. He, off he actually offered the course online for free to military. I don't know if he still does or not. Um, very beneficial. You kind of dig deep, but you don't really have a coach. You don't have anyone helping you then process all this information, all this stuff that you're learning about yourself through kind of trying to remember old stories or what have you. And so it was a couple couple months, maybe maybe three or four months before taking command. And it was just very important to me that my command vision and philosophy was real, that it was me and that it was something that wasn't just a piece of paper on the wall, which I've seen in other other commands, that it actually was something that I I believed in, that was core to who I was, that I could lead from. And so. To me, the only way to figure that out was to dig deep and to really just figure out, like, what are those things that are super important to me? What are my core values? What are my core principles? And I tried it before and it didn't work. So I wanted to hire a coach. Uh, and so I did. I hired a coach. And what she helped me do is exactly what I've been talking about is to over the course of six to eight months or so, you know, um, one call per week during that time, we just dug deep old stories about my childhood, stories about daily life while I was going through it. Um, and so through that process, you kind of dig down and just, you got, you end up with all this stuff like purpose, passion, value, skills, all these things. Um, it, I'm looking at it. I keep looking over here cause it's on my wall, right? This blueprint. Um, I wish it was behind me so you could see it, but you get all this stuff. But now you have a coach. I had a coach now to help me filter it down to the things that are really core to who I am, super important to me. And so, you know, she boils it down to like top 10, but that doesn't really do it justice because it's a continual process. You're always learning more about yourself and even things that are super important to me in, in five years, maybe some other things kind of move up the ladder, so to speak. And, and some of those some of those things that were maybe top 10 aren't anymore. But we really drilled down to a couple of the core core aspects for me. One, the reason I'm still in the Navy is certainly not for the money. It's certainly not for the prestige. It is because of the team. So a core principle of mine is team, right? And what I mean by that is I like to be part of strong teams. I don't have to be the leader. I just want to be part of strong teams that are aligned with core principles, are aligned to a mission, right? 
And I lucked out and in an aviation, naval aviation, I've had that. I've had that in all my squadrons. Okay. I'm sure there's some pilots out there who have not. They've been in some squadrons where it wasn't that good. I guess I lucked out and I've always had that. All right. So team, what about the team though? Do I really love? I love when I think that I can make my teammates better, whether it's I mean, it could be 0.1%, right? If you want to put a number on it, it could be just, you walk away from our conversation. You feel a little bit better about yourself or a little bit better about what's going on. To me, that just, that's what I like. Okay. And I believe the best way to do that, to be able to do that, to be in a position to do that is to focus on your personal development first, to focus on yourself first, because by doing that, you're just going to build your capacity right? It's like when you're the new guy on the team, you don't know where the the locker room's at. You don't know where the bathroom's at, right? So how are you going to help anyone else get better? You have to work on yourself. You have to get better. And by doing that, you're automatically going to raise up your teammates. I didn't know how to articulate that before I hired a coach. And so my coach helped me articulate those things. And then to dig deeper, really to find those core principles that that motivate me, that were woven into my whole philosophy, the principles of team, mindset, focusing on the things that you actually can control, your actions, your responses to circumstances. And then also with mindset, bringing, you bring the mindset that you're going to use, right? That you're going to make decisions from, you bring that mindset to the table. You choose that. And then humility. I know that I don't know everything. And I believe that lifelong, continual learning, continual growth is key. And that is what I wanted to bring to the command that, you know, that when we were, when we were good, when we were doing good, Hey, what can we learn? How can we do this better? Because something out there is, is going to get us right. So, um, yeah. I'll stop there. I know I've been I've been talking for a little while now. How does one um, how does one find and vet a coach? That's a great question. Um, I found my coach from somebody else, right? So I think referrals are probably step one. Um, I found my coach from a mentor of mine that had also worked with her, and so that was the initial step. And then we had a couple phone calls together. And, you know, figured out that we were a good fit and would make a good team. Um, But it's very important, of course, that you see eye to eye with your coach. You're not your coach is going to help you find out things about yourself that maybe you didn't know or just bring those things to the surface. Um, So you might not be able to finish each other's sentences, but you certainly should should have core principles, core values belief system, right? Shouldn't be too far off um, because you're going to be working a lot with this person. And, you know, this person is going to help you hopefully get better, right? As part of your team, going to raise you up. Um, So that's how I did it. I'm curious, have have you talked with any of your peers? Like, have you mentioned that you hired a coach to other commanders? And if so, what has their reaction been? Like, is this something that it, you've noticed is kind of a trend or are you the anomaly amongst your peer group? Um, I don't know if I'm an anomaly or not. I don't personally know any other um, commanders or, you know, CEOs that were my peers who hired coaches. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not out there and they don't exist. And, and that doesn't mean that they're certainly, certainly doesn't mean that they're not, doing the work of personal development and trying to grow. Right. But maybe it means they didn't you know, take the extra step and, and hire a coach to work with. Um, that was my really nice way of saying, where were you when I was in? I mean, I had, I, don't get me wrong. I had some nice leaders, uh, some good, some good leaders. Um, but I think that it's really cool that you were willing to take time off duty and open your wallet off duty to do personal development for your upcoming command like that. That's, I think that speaks volume about 
how serious you took command, right? And and what you were willing to do for your sailors going into that unit. I'm I'm sure that if we were to go through and do like a command climate before and after, I would imagine that if you put that much effort and care into command before you took over, that the climate at your command is probably improved while you were there, right? It probably came through. Well, it's also personal development. So I'm sorry, Brandon, it's also personal development. So I'm like, dude, this is an investment into your whole life, not just the command. And I, and I, you know, I'm on this fence about this coaching thing. I've been thinking about it for a while because I'm sort of a loose cannon and I'm like a terrible, I need a boss sort of thing. I need accountability, not a boss. Um, and I look at it and I'm like, oh no, you know, I do a lot of personal development myself, read a lot of books, you know, part of the war room. I have a good social group, but I also think, what could I do that's better if I had somebody that was, you know, holding me accountable in a different way? So, you know, that's why I'm, I, I was so curious because as David said, there's probably so few people who take that step to hire somebody to hold them sort of personally, like accountable to their life, not just, you know, to a job or, you know, to family or to kids or to, you know, your partnership, you know, at work, whatever, but like to, Hey, look, you need to get better at all of life. Or, you know, I'm sure that's the general gist of what you guys do. So I find that to be, um, it's very intriguing. And it's one of those things where it's like how this is a tremendous way to separate yourself, um, in terms of ambition from a lot of people. Yeah, Alex. Yeah. First, I want to kind of go back to what Dave said about the command climate survey. First of all, I have no idea how that would turn out. Um, but the one thing that I would want, the one thing that I would measure the success, my success there would be is do people at the command, if they looked at me now, if they looked at the command philosophy, was I true to that? Was I authentic? Mm -hmm. Did I live up to the things I was saying? Did my actions align? That's it right there. It's not, did they love me? You know, did I, did I make them better? Did they get more liberty? It's not about that. It's about, was I, did I do the best I could? Because that's who I was and I was being authentic and leading from how, the only way I knew how to. To me, that would be the measure, kind of the measure of success. Um, and then Alex, what yours, the, so the co what the coach helps help me do is look at things, you're, you mentioned it, right? Your spouse can't really do it. Your best friend can't do it because they know you so well, right? So they're just, you're just, I'm sure there's some scientific study out there that says they are just automatically going to assume some things about you because they're so close to you. Whereas the coach is looking at this stuff objectively, right? Is, is, is looking at your story, what you're bringing to the table that day during that discussion and is looking at it from the outside as an object and saying, okay, looks like you applied, you know, she calls them players on your bench. Looks like you applied some of these strengths. Looks like your weaknesses were coming through here. How'd you feel about that? And it's just objectively looking at things in a way that you can't do or that's very difficult for you to do. And very difficult for those who are closest to you to do as well. And that's why I never just never work with like a, a good best friend to try to help me out. You know, my wife, I just had to get a coach to, to have that objective point of view. Dude, I'm like the probably, I, I think David would say I'm probably the rawest person he knows. I hit people straight between the eyes, almost universally. I just say what I think. And I'm just very little care about your short-term feelings and I always care about people's long-term success. And yet, even with that, my there's groups of people that I just can't... There's just a certain conflict you can't do with people you know too well. I can't do it with David sometimes. I'm like, I told you this or you know, I wanted to tell you this, but you got to hear from somebody else. And that's just the way it is. So having somebody that's like, you know, and you got their vibe, but they're going to come in like a wrecking ball into your life and you're like, no, you're lying. That's an excuse. That's BS. Suck it up do this, you're wrong, all these things, like just hit you straight. I don't know if that's what you need or or that's the exact process. That's certainly like what I would need. I only speak in terms of, I only know how to love people with tough love and I only know how to respond to tough love. But whatever it is, like you said, the objectivity of like, I care about your success, but I don't care about your, um, I, I see it from the outside. So I'm not bought into all your excuses. Like that stuff works on your family. You're too close to it. They hear it every day. You know, it wears people down. Your Your complacency wears people down, but it's not working on me. You know, as as the coach would say, right? It's not working on me. So this is what you're gonna do. Suck it up. Quit selling me that bullshit. Get to work. 
that sort of thing. Well, I've done, uh, first off, I would say John also competes, I think, with you for being a, a raw jerkhead sometimes to me. But uh, I've done some coaching as well um, on a couple different things with a couple different people. And I think you're right about the like person who can just tell you how it is from a different angle and isn't too personally tied to you to like, you know, they, they can't see the forest through the trees. Um, but I also, for me, what I found helpful was somebody who, if they're in that role, right? Like they have a lot of exercises. So like, if you're struggling with something, they can give you an exercise to do that'll help you just really flesh an idea out. So like for me, one of the most influential things this guy gave me was, it was literally just three circles on a piece of paper. And it was like, <clears throat> One of the circles said uh, passion and the other said uh, proficiency and the other said profit or something like that. And it was like they overlap and in the middle is like unique sales proposition, right? If all if you're passionate, proficient and can profit from it, then that's your unique sales proposition. But if you're just passionate and proficient but you can't make any money, then – you know, that's not going to work. And if you're passionate and can make money, but you suck at it, then, you know, whatever. And if you're proficient and profitable, but you hate it, then that's boredom. And it, like it broke it all out and you just like draw, you fill in all the circles before he gave you which one was boredom, which one was unpro, you know, whatever. And I'm like, which it was like hobby, boredom, failure were the three overlaps for the two circles in the middle. And I was like, oh, and it really helped me kind of align like, oh, that should just be a hobby instead of something I'm actually focusing a whole lot of effort on. Um, and so like simple things like that, that I would have never thought about that really helped me out with a lot this year. So, yeah, yeah like mental models, sure. decision making frameworks it can be extremely we helpful. We need to get some we need to I get some I coaches on this show, David, so we can vet them for everybody on air. <laughs> That's what we need to do. I actually. I'm sure the guy that was working with me would be more than happy to be a guest. He's a cool dude. Good deal. Hey, Alex, you mentioned something though. So I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of not like you, right? I, I actually, if you do the strengths, the Gallup strengths finder, I think is what it's called. Um, Harmony is pretty high on my strengths. I'd say top five, right? So I'm a harmonizer. And so I would say you look at that as a strength, but then on the flip side of that is a weakness of mine, which is kind of conflict and kind of in your face type stuff. Right. And so knowing that, you know, a coach who's right for me might not be the right coach for you because I probably wouldn't do as well with somebody. I need accountability. Don't get me wrong. And that's one of the reasons I love the war room so much and green squad. Um, but if somebody's in your face like that, it kind of, it just puts me off a little bit just because it's so, it's so different from how I am. And so for a coach, somebody who's going to be working with you that closely, right? You would need somebody who could be in your face like that. And so, for example, if I was a coach, I probably would not be a good fit for you. I'm totally projecting. You're right. I'm very, I'm very much projecting. Um, yeah, that's why it's so hard for me to find people that are good leadership for me because I need somebody that's like tough, but also like I'm really tough. So you got to out, you got to out, uh, you got to out tough and outperform me. Out tough, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but I was de you're right. I'm very, I'm very much projecting, but um, you know, finding somebody that can hold you accountable in the way in, in, and speak in the language that you that you're fluent, most fluent in. All right, Brandon, we told you when we started recording that we normally keep it to about 30 to 45 minutes. We are now at 48. So is there anything that we have missed or any questions that you would have liked us to ask? Anything you think we should have covered? I don't think so, Dave. I, I've enjoyed this conversation. I think we've touched on a little bit of everything. Awesome. Quick, Alex, disconnect your speakers so Brandon can drop his sales pitch. <laughs> hey, I have no sales pitch. Look, I'm most active on LinkedIn. So just go on LinkedIn and find Brandon Jenkins. And if you like what I'm posting, interact with me. That's it. Oh, you, you saved me a question. I appreciate you. Look at that efficiency. <laughs> Dude, thanks for joining us today. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, I've, I've, I loved it. I can't believe it's taking this long. 
I know it's Alex's fault, but <laughs> as a as a way to repay you for that, he's going to do the outro right now, which he prepared for like weeks in advance. Thank you for listening to the Military to Millionaire podcast. Please subscribe to us on iTunes. Live as a five star review because we deserve it. I have been your host, Alex Fleece, my lovely, wonderful uh, co-host, David Prey. We are signing off. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode about my journey from military to millionaire. If you liked it, be sure to visit from military to slash podcast to subscribe to future podcasts. While you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show. Give us a review on iTunes. Now get out there and take action.